Hi, Doug and Mary. Tom here at Family Marine. Uh, we got your boat all done. It's ready to go. Ready to be put in the water. Have some fun. Get the family out there. Ready? It's going to get warm out now. I'm excited for you guys. Um, normally, what we would have you guys do is come in and we would do a walkthrough with you and show you how to operate the boat, how to break it in, all that kind of stuff. But of course, because of this COVID-19 and social distancing thing, we thought it would be better if we did this little video for you. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through the boat and um, make, sh make sure that you know how to operate everything, where all the gauges should read, how to break in the engine. And we'll just kind of do a little walk around as we're here in back in the showroom. Now regarding your trailer, um, your trailer is going to be in very soon. I just talked to the manufacturer and we've got them coming. Uh, for now, of course, uh, Corey lined it up where you could borrow our trailer. And hopefully it would work, sure work out nice if when you bring the trailer back and your new one's ready to go, but I don't know about that. It's, we'll have to see how that goes. So anyway, what I'm going to do is start up in the front. We'll walk down the side and we'll show you everything there is to know. And by the way, I hope you like the colors, man. That burgundy and that black sure look nice together. Blackout package. Everything's looking beautiful on this pontoon. So starting up in the front, of course, we've got our electric horn right here. We've got our pop-up stainless cleats, our LED navigation light, our LED docking lights. Here's our little loops that we can tie our rope around and hang our boat bumper from. There's four of these, two on each side, two in the front, two in the back. You just hang your boat bumper down to protect your boat from getting damaged when it's alongside the dock. And then, of course, as you walk down the back of the pontoon, you'll see the second loop here. We have our rear safety stanchions with safety chains. We have our stern boarding ladder, telescopic boarding ladder. Now, um, down below here, I want to point this out. This is our transducer for our depth finder. Now, as you can see, it's angled down just a little bit. That's the way we want it, angled just a little bit. On a transducer for a depth finder, you cannot have any air bubbles on the bottom of the transducer. Okay? So what would happen is if you did get air bubbles here, your depth finder would just really quit working. It wouldn't read anything. It would go wacko. All right? So we want to have solid water down here. Now, this is on a kick-up bracket. So let's say you're driving across the lake and you were to hit a little twig or something with this transducer. It would pop up. All right? So... Again, if you're driving across the lake and all of a sudden your depth finder goes wacko, yeah, you might have hit something and this thing has popped up. So you got to reach down in there and push it down so that it's angled down just a little bit. There's our motor, of course. Um, I'm glad you guys upgraded to the 200 horse. Boy, that V6, man, that thing is powerful. You're really going to like that. We've got our stainless steel mercury inertia prop on there. The maximum RPM on this engine is 6,000 RPM. So the operating range at wide open throttle on this engine is 5,000 to 6,000 RPM. So what we do is we put a propeller on there that's going to allow you to rev real close to that 6,000 RPM at wide open throttle with a light load. That way when you get a heavy load, you're still in the operating range that you should be. So um, braking on the motor, um, kind of simple. There's an hour meter up on the tachometer, and I'll show you that in a little bit. So for the first hour, no more than 3,000 RPM, okay? And vary the throttle speeds. Just mix it up a little bit. You don't have to run it wide open. They don't want to run it at wide open throttle. Uh, just mix up the throttle speeds. So the second hour, no more than 4,000 RPM. And again, vary the throttle speeds. And then for the next eight hours, you can crack it open so short bursts of wide open throttle, short being oh, a minute or so. Okay, and then again, vary the throttle speed. So what they're really trying to say to you is, they don't want you to baby the engine, like tie it to a dock and let it idle for 10 hours, but then you don't want to pound on it either. Just a nice, even, well-rounded break-in period. Okay, now you probably know that you have to have this motor in the water in order to operate it. Down here are these little vents, these water intakes. That's where the engine sucks water into the motor to cool it. 
So those things have to be in the water. If you were to start your motor and run your motor for even as little as 30 seconds out of water, you could burn the water pump impeller out of it. All right, so you have to be in the water with those vents. Now, there is a overheating warning horn on this engine. If this engine hits 240 degrees, the horn up at the dash will come on and the motor will go into what we call limp mode. It won't go any more than 1,000 RPM. Limp, L-I-M-P, um, enough to get you back home. Truth is, for me, if my motor overheats and my horn comes on, first thing I'm doing is shutting it off, of course, tilting it up, because I probably have weeds covering those water intakes. Very common. We see that all the time. All right. Um, clean those weeds off. Start up the engine, let it cool down, away you go. Now, if you didn't have weeds, it means your water pump impeller went out. Um, take the hood off, uh, let it cool down for half an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, something like that. Start it up and, and try to get back to shore. All right? So that's your overheating warning system. This engine also has a low oil pressure warning system. Uh, I've never seen it happen, but theoretically it could happen where you have such low oil in this engine that you don't have enough oil pressure. Again, that horn will go on up front by the helm and the motor will go into limp mode, allowing so that it won't damage the engine. 40 years of doing this, I've never seen that happen, but theory says it could, so they put a low oil pressure warning system on it. Okay, this is your telltale. So when you start your engine, you're gonna get a stream of water coming out here. That's a sign that says that your water pump impeller is pumping water through the engine. Now, sometimes people freak out about this, is we don't get any water out of here, but the overheating warning horn up at the helm doesn't go off. Um, that's okay, because what can happen is this can get clogged with sand or seaweed or algae, and it blocks the water from coming out here. As long as that overheating warning horn doesn't go on, that's the most important part, right? So what we do is we just blow air in that hole. That way, if there's any sand or seaweed or algae, it'll clean it out and go back to working properly. Okay. Once we get up on top of the boat, I'll show you how to check your oil. It's really easy on this engine. You just open that little trap door. So speaking of that, let's go in and take a look at the inside. Okay, here we are um, in the back of the pontoon. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is the battery on off switch. So down here is this red switch and on the end of it, it has a little white arrow. So when the arrow is pointed up, it says off and you turn it to the right two clicks. Okay, because there's two batteries in here. The first click is battery one. The second click is both batteries. So we always want to operate it on both batteries. Okay. This little unit right here is called a VSR, a voltage sensitive relay. And what that does is it senses which of your two batteries is low and sends the juice from the alternator to the battery that needs to be charged without overcharging the battery that doesn't need to be charged. So that's a really nice feature to have. Underneath here are your two batteries. There's a little cover you can undo the snaps and there's our two batteries so one is labeled engine battery the other is labeled house battery okay so this house battery operates your stereo your accessories everything else on board the boat this battery is dedicated just to start the engine Okay, uh, mounted on our ski tow bar is our uh, flagpole. Now, it's inside the boat because we don't want you going down the highway with this flagpole in place. It'll ruin the flag. So that's underneath the seat. Um, our engine, I mentioned that there is a dipstick under here. You push the hard, down hard on that, and here's our dipstick. So if you want to check your engine oil, that's very easy to do. You just pull it out all the way, and there's little yellow dots on the bottom that tell you how much oil you have in it. This is our oil fill, if we were to add oil. And this little lever handle here is what we use to lift the hood off if we need to. We can push this red button, 
lift up on the handle and now I can pop the hood right off. I'm not going to do it right now, uh, but we could just lift the hood right off the motor. And then once we set it back in place, we move the lever down, push it down till it clicks, and we're set to go. Close our door. All right, very easy. Our gas fill is down below. The, the tank is full. By the way, um, this engine can use 87 octane fuel with as much as 10% ethanol. Okay, if they ever go to 15% ethanol, nope, can't do it. Can't use E15. However, we really don't even like E10. Here's the reason why. Um, often, a pontoon can sit for a number of weeks without being used. And in the heat, especially in the heat, what can happen is the alcohol can separate from the fuel and settle to the bottom of the tank. Okay? So now all of a sudden you have this pure blob of pure alcohol in the bottom of the tank. Well, you get in, start your engine, and this blob of alcohol moves back to the fuel pickup. Next thing you know, you're burning pure alcohol in your engine, and it doesn't run. We see this quite often in our industry. Um, unlike your car, where you're constantly replenishing your fuel in your car, um, if you did that with your boat, that'd be fine. You could use 87 octane with 10% ethanol, but most people don't do that. Uh, because, again, a gas can sit in the boat. We have people telling us, golly, they didn't even go through a tank of gas in the whole summer. Um, that's why we recommend 91 non-oxygenated. Now, not all gas stations have that. Um, most marinas are going to sell it to you. But uh, if you go to a gas station and you look at the 91 octane pump, and there's a little white label above the pump that says non-oxygenated, to be used in classic cars, snowmobiles, boats, ATVs, motorcycles, lawnmowers, chainsaws, etc., small engines. Okay. Um, that's the fuel that doesn't have any alcohol in it. That's the fuel that we prefer that you use in your boat. Okay, since I'm at the back of the boat, I wanted to talk about sea legs. Um, first thing is you have your remote control, and you have your power button up on top, and then you have 10 switches. Now you notice the top one says boat up and boat down. Okay, so here's what you need to do. Think about what you want the boat to do. If I want to lift my boat up, we go boat up. That means the legs are going down. If you think about what the legs are doing, you're, uh, it's all wacko. <laughs> you're going to get it all mixed up. I want the boat to go up, which means the legs will go down. So I push this button, and that's all four legs going down simultaneously. If I want the boat to go down, I push that button. That's all four legs running simultaneously. I can run the front legs up or down. I can run the rear legs up or down. I can run the passenger side legs up or down or the driver's side legs up or down. But it's always two legs at the same time. You can't control one leg individually. It's always two. Two rear, two or four I should say. Two rear, two front, two port, two starboard. Okay, again. Think about what you want the boat to do. I want the boat to go up. That's legs going down. Now, it's normal that the front of the boat is going to come up sooner than the back of the boat. Two reasons. Number one, it's usually shallower up front than it is in the back, so it takes longer for the legs to hit the bottom of the lake in the back. Number two, it's heavier in the back, so it's a little bit slower in the back than it is in the front. Sometimes as you're going boat up, the bow of the boat starts to come up first, well, you stop and you go rear up, and then that will level the boat. You go back to boat up, and it'll continue to lift up. Okay? So, um, on that second battery that's tagged house, that's the battery that is hooked to the sea legs. We want the motor to be on its individual own battery. That way, uh, you're not running the starting motor battery down with the sea legs. Sea legs use a lot of juice coming out of the battery. Now, sometimes what can happen is, let's say that you uh, have your boat sitting at your dock up on sea legs and you go down and you lower it down 
And you go for an hour cruise, but you're not going very fast. And you put it back up on sea legs when you're done. And you do the same thing the next day. And you do the same thing the next day. What can happen is the sea legs pump can draw more amperage out of the battery than what the alternator is putting in, particularly at slow speeds. Okay, an alternator really doesn't kick in high amperage until 2,000 RPM or above. All right, so you run the risk of running your house battery down. And what can happen is the pump is trying to draw all this amperage out of the battery. And if the battery doesn't have the amperage to deliver to the pump, the circuit breaker on the pump will blow. And way underneath here is the circuit breaker. You see this blue button? Okay, that's the circuit breaker. I could push that blue button and that yellow arm will pop out. That tells me that my circuit breaker is popped. I don't know if you can see that yellow arm. Yep. And that's a sign that says that your battery is low. Charge your battery, push that little yellow arm back in until it clicks. Now we're ready to go. Now I had a guy one time that was sitting at the sandbar up on his sea legs. He was there for four, five, six hours listening to his stereo. And of course this thing has an amplifier. No, I'm sorry, this does not have an amplifier. But anyway, uh, he was listening to a stereo and he ran down his house battery to the point where it would constantly blow that circuit breaker because now the battery was low. Fortunately, the water intakes in the lower unit that I just showed you were in the water and he was able to start his engine, rev the engine up to about 2000 RPM, which was charging the battery at a higher rate than it would at idle. And he was putting amperage back into his house battery and after about five, 10 minutes, he was able to operate his sea legs because he had charged that battery, all right? So that's very important. We see that quite often. By the way, um, if you ever lose this remote control, you have switches down below in that gray box, front up, down, rear up, down. So you can operate your sea legs using that box down below. Now, a problem that we see occasionally is um, rocks getting stuck in the sea legs. Here's what can happen. When our sea legs are stored up underneath the deck of the boat, I'll do it like this, the pads are level, the legs are level with the bottom of the boat. And as the legs go down, the pads hit the bottom of the lake. And as they go up, they're supposed to swivel, all right? But what can happen is we can get rocks back in here, preventing them from swiveling. So as I lift my legs up, they go up like this. Now it's a big water plow. I start my engine. I, I'm driving across the lake. Um, the engine's rattling. The boat's shaking. I'm doing 15 miles an hour wide open throttle. And everybody calls and says, Tom, there's something wrong with my engine. And I say, well, what's it doing? It's shaking, it's rattling. I can only get 15 miles an hour out of it. Well, did you check your sea legs? No, no, my engine, something's wrong with my engine. <laughs> no, check your sea legs. This happens all the time. And, and if they're plowing through the water, that's gonna aerate the water where the prop is trying to bite solid water and it's gonna shake, all right? So what you do is you lay down on the front of the deck and you look underneath there and you go, oh yeah. There's my leg, my pad, sticking down, all right? Even though the beeper went off that tells you when your legs are all the way up, there's a beeper there, all right? Uh, but when it's stuck like that, it still beeps, but we're plowing through the water, and, and that, that just doesn't work. That means we gotta lower our leg a little bit. Yeah, we gotta crawl underneath there. We gotta dig those rocks out of there, make sure that that pad swivels. It's actually spring-loaded so that it, it springs back to this position, all right, so that it goes up and down like it's supposed to. But yeah, rocks get in there. We see that all the time. Okay, on the helm itself, we have our multi-gauges up here. So here's our tachometer. Here's our voltmeter. Here's our fuel gauge. As you can see, the tank is full. Voltmeter is 12 volts. The engine's not running, so the tach is going to read zero, of course. And this gray screen down below is our hour meter. 
And right now it has 0.5 hours on it. Yeah, that's from us testing the engine. All right. So the, 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 the uh, voltmeter, um, yeah, you start getting down around 10, 11 volts, you may not have enough juice in the battery to start the engine. You need 10.8 volts in that battery to start that engine. Fire off the ignition system. Fuel, um, I'm here to tell you, fuel gauges in boats are notorious for being inaccurate. Sometimes people tell me that they can run forever on a quarter tank of fuel. Sometimes they tell me they run out at a quarter tank of fuel. I've seen both. Every boat is different. We never know which one it is. So you've got to be cautious of that. Our speedometer. This is a GPS-driven speedometer. So it gets its signal from uh, GPS. And then here's our trim gauge. Of course, our trim gauge measures the angle of our outboard motor. Okay. Our stereo. Our power button is here. Turn that on, we hold it for about 3-4 seconds, and it'll power up. Volume. We can change the color of the lighting. You don't have a sub in this boat. And then your menu is down below, and you can toggle through your stations. You can set your presets by going to your menu. You can set your presets right there. To turn it on, you can change from radio to XM, Sirius XM, USB, which is this jack over here. So if you're going to plug your stereo, or your, excuse me, your cell phone into your stereo, you'd plug it in over here, and you would turn this menu, oops, I'm sorry, source, um, to USB. Oh, I went one too far. There we go or auxiliary. There's your Bluetooth. Very easy to hook up your Bluetooth and radio. We push in the center, it goes right to that. Okay, um, owner's manual for the radio is in the uh, garbage basket, which is just ahead of the console. So stereos, yeah, pretty simple. Decent sounding system in here. Okay, tilt wheel. We got a little button underneath the wheel. You push it forward and you got a five position tilt wheel. Okay, um, navigation lights are red and green up front and our stern light in the back. Anchor light is over to the right. Off is in the middle. Our horn button. We do have a bilge pump in here, so we can check the forward bilge pump or we can check the stern bilge pump. Oops, I'm sorry, this one just has one bilge pump in it. Nope, I'm sorry. There's two, right, Corey? Just one in this one. Oh, just one in this one. Okay. All right, just one in this one. Now, what happens is that storage locker in the back... You don't have that. Oh, you don't have a storage locker on this one. That's right. This is an E-series, so you don't have that. That's why there's only one down in the center of the pontoon. Um, courtesy light is one up here on the side of the helm. Dome light is, if you, when you open up your bimini, you'll see a light up under there. Docking lights, of course, are headlights up front. Okay. And then there's four accessory switches on the bottom, which are not hooked to anything. All right. Now, here's the hard thing about these um, accessory switches. You'll notice that you have a little red light in the tip of the switch. And I'm here to tell you that and when it's sunny out, it's kind of hard to tell that that switch is on or that little red light is on. So what I recommend to people is when you're done using the boat, shut the battery on off switch off. That way all of these switches will go dead. All right, and you won't ruin and drain down your battery. That way you don't have to worry about something being left on. Always shut your battery switch off when you're done using the boat. Now, over on the side, of course, is our Lowrance depth finder. This is the uh, Hook 5 um, color depth finder. All right, simple on-off button right here. You hold it in for a couple of seconds. It takes a minute or two to boot up. Again, I always forget to, put, to turn my depth finder off. And the easiest thing for me to do is to turn that battery switch back there off. 
That way I don't forget and leave this thing on. All right. Down below here is our ignition switch. And I didn't talk about starting the engine, but it's pretty basic. Turn the key. You don't advance the throttle. There is no choke. This is electronic fuel injection. All you do is turn the key. Above the key is a power outlet, a 12-volt power outlet. To the right of that is your canopy, your power electric canopy up and down, up, down. Now, if you're going to take the boot off and use the bimini, if you're going to, real sunny day, if you're going to use the bimini, what you want to do is lower the bimini all the way down. Now you can take your boot off and open up your bimini, hit the up button. Uh, if you try to open up, if you try to take your boot off with the bimini, you know, part way up, what will happen is the rear bar of the bimini frame will come slamming down on you. You could hurt somebody. So you want to lower it down in the position that we have it in right here with these trailering arms in the position. Now you can just take your boot off and then you hit your up button and that'll open the bimini up all the way. And then once you get it opened all the way, then you take these arms right here and you lock them into this little clip right here. That round part just sits right in there. And that little locking release button right there is what you use to release it. Um, the reason that they do that is if they didn't have those front arms, you'd have a sticker on the bimini that would say, do not exceed 25 miles an hour. Well, what that really means is 15 miles an hour into a 10 mile an hour headwind. The reason they say that is without those arms, that wind could rip the bimini down right off the back of the boat. I've seen them break. But with those arms, those support arms, yeah, we never have an issue. So it's very important when you open up your bimini, you gotta put those arms into place. Okay. Um, Often I get asked about care and maintenance on the vinyl and the flooring. Um, the vinyl, this is great stuff. The vinyl has a um, ultraviolet light inhibitor built into it uh, to reflect the ultraviolet light from the sun. Therefore, it won't dry out, crack, and tear. I'm a little anal. I like to treat mine with a additional treatment. Uh, we sell a product called Bolt Bling. It's called uh, Vinyl Conditioning Sauce. It has a very high content of UV inhibitor built into it also. And what I do is I treat my uh, vinyl in my boat once a year, usually in the spring, with this conditioning sauce. And number one, I found out that it does make the vinyl a little easier to clean up. And, but the most important thing is it's conditioning the, the vinyl. It's keeping it soft and supple. It's reflecting the ultraviolet light from the sun. All right. And I'm here to tell you that if you were to do that once a spring every year, You'll bring this boat back in 20 years, and that vinyl will look just like that. There won't be any fading. There won't be any drying out or cracking or tearing. It's just fabulous stuff. I use it at home on my uh, 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 tires, on my garden tractor, on my utility trailer, on my lawn furniture. Anything that's vinyl, rubber, leather, or plastic that's outside and is susceptible to fading and deteriorating from the sunlight, I use it on there, and I prolong the length of my stuff for many, many years because of that vinyl sauce. Um, now, uh, you do not want to put any of that on your flooring. What will happen is your flooring will get really slippery because the flooring is PVC where this is vinyl. PVC will not absorb any product that you put onto it, therefore it will get really slippery. So what I do is instead of spraying the stuff on my seat and having some of it fall down onto the floor and make it slippery, I spray it onto a rag, I wipe it around. Spray it on a rag, wipe it around. That way I'm not getting any mist falling down onto the floor. Um, the flooring, yeah, don't treat it with anything uh, to clean it. Uh, hot soapy water and a scrub brush and a garden hose. It's really all you need. It's just it's fabulous stuff. I've never seen anything stain this stuff yet. Um, I'm sure there's something out there that can, but mustard, tea, grease, oil, uh, nope, doesn't stain it. So it's, uh, again, very ultraviolet light protectant. We don't have any problem with the sun fading the flooring at all. So um, any more questions that you may have, uh, Corey and I are always available. Please give us a call. 
we can help you out, usually right over the phone. Uh, we appreciate your business. Thank you very much. Um, I know you guys are just going to love this pontoon. It is absolutely stunning. Uh, biggest problem is you're going to have so many people coming up to you saying, where'd you get that beautiful boat? Oh, that thing's nice. 200 horse. Whoa. <laughs> right? Uh, well, you, you got to talk to them. You got to tell them, Family Marine, come and see Corey. He can help you out. <laughs> so again, thank you guys very, very much. And we appreciate you watching. Hi, I'm Tom. And I'm Gloria from Family Marine and RV. We don't just offer boats for sale. We offer memories on the water with family and friends. Like the time your son or daughter learned to ski or catch the big fish for the very first time. Or maybe that evening cruise with family and friends. At Family Marine and RV, we carry a complete line of premier pontoons with Yamaha outboards. Stop in and see them at our giant indoor showroom on North Highway 71 in Wilmer. Check out FamilyMarineBoats.com. Oh,